Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. On Friday, September 28th, a panel of three judges will review the appeal of a ruling by a judge that said that the section of the NDAA, that's the National Defense Appropriation Act, that's the section that's been very controversial that essentially allows for the military to detain people without trial, people in general, that means citizens and non-citizens, if they are connected with al-Qaeda or, quote, associated with it, whatever that means, and that's part of what the problem is, whatever that means. Well, a legal case that was launched against this section included Chris Hedges, and he now joins us to give us an update on what's happening. Chris is a senior fellow at the Nation Institute. He writes a weekly column for Truth Dig. He's an author, a best-selling author. His newest book is Days of Revolt, Days of Destruction. Thanks very much for joining us, Chris. Thank you, Paul. So where do things, first, for people that aren't up on the case, give us a little background and then where are, where, where are we at and what's happening on in this panel today? Well, on December 31st, President Obama signed into law the National Defense Authorization Act, which included Section 1021. Section 1021 permits the U.S. government to overturn 200 years of domestic law uh, and empower the military to carry out policing duties, uh, to detain American citizens, hold them in military facilities, and strip them of due process until, in the language of that section, the end of hostilities, which of course is indefinite detention. Uh, in January, the lawyers Carl Mayer and Bruce Afron approached me about suing the president along with the defense secretary uh, over Section 1021 of the NDAA. Uh, we brought that case before Judge Catherine Forrest in the Southern District Court of New York. I was eventually joined in that lawsuit by six other activists, including Noam Chomsky, uh, and Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, the last hearing on the case uh, was in August, and uh, in September, Judge Forrest ruled that the uh, Section 1021 was, in fact, unconstitutional, and uh, she issued a permanent injunction. During the trial, she had issued a temporary injunction against that law uh, while it was being challenged in court. The Obama administration, uh, which had appealed the temporary injunction, uh, filed an emergency appeal against the permanent injunction. Uh, they at first asked Judge Forrest to consider a stay, uh, meaning the injunction uh, would go back into effect until it was appealed in the appellate court, uh, which uh, we'll start hearing it tomorrow, uh, the 28th, Friday. And uh, she refused. Uh, they demanded uh, an emergency stay. 9 a.m. Next, the next morning. They, they filed it on Friday, and so it was 9 a.m. on Monday morning. Uh, unfortunately, the appellate court did issue a stay, putting that law back into effect. Now, why is it so dangerous? Uh, it, 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 it expands the power of the executive branch beyond anything we have seen, uh, including under the Authorization to Use Military Force Act of 2001, the Patriot Act, uh, even the FISA Amendment Act, which allows for the warrantless wiretapping monitoring and eavesdropping of tens of millions of American citizens. And we now know that all our information is being stored out in supercomputers in uh, Utah. And uh, the, the language of the section, as Judge Forrest noted in her 112-page ruling, is, uh, is very vague and very nebulous. Uh, it uh, not only uh, permits the military to seize U.S. citizens who have links uh, to al-Qaeda or the Taliban, uh, but to what they call associated forces. Uh, it allows the government to seize citizens who substantially support terrorism activity. And during the course of the trial, uh, Alex O'Brien, who was one of the plaintiffs uh, from U.S. Day of Rage, presented to the court uh, email correspondence uh, back and forth uh, from Stafford, a, a private security firm, which these emails, five million of them, had been uh, leaked by WikiLeaks, uh, which attempted to link U.S. Day of Rage with al-Qaeda. And this is precisely the problem. You pass these laws in the name of the war uh, on terror, uh, and then you use them to criminalize uh, legitimate dissent, uh, as well as criminalize uh, groups uh, in opposition uh, to, uh, to the ruling elite. 
Uh, it's something that we saw in the whole uh, long, uh, decades-long battle uh, against communism. Uh, it's exactly the same kind of template. Uh, and uh, it allows the government to classify an entire section of the population as essentially outside of the, uh, you, you know, outside legal boundaries. I mean, to strip them of, of due process, strip them of their legal rights. Uh, and that's why this section... Uh, 1021 is so frightening. And, and I suppose once you have a section like this and, and it's established, you could then pass a little amendment, for example, add Iranian Revolutionary Guard to that list, and maybe you could add some other... But, the, the, you know, they don't even need to do that because Associated Forces is a kind of catch-all where, uh, you, you know, what are they? Uh, it, it, it's, in ba it's basically anything the government decides uh, is, uh, you know, linked or has within it uh, terrorist intentions can be included. So the the language, and then and Judge Forrest pointed that out in her opinion that, that the language was was purposely so undefined as essentially to empower the government to carry out those kinds of activities against anybody they wanted to. Now the other part of this, which, which I don't think has had as much attention as the the substantive issue of you can simply detain people without trial, but is that it, the, the power was given to the military. I mean, yeah. you, you know, you can imagine you could have said the FBI, you could have said the police that are supposed to be doing this kind of domestic work. But we know, I mean, people, those of us who are these kind of wonks that follow this sort of thing, that military intelligence apparently is bigger than all the other intelligence agencies put together. And now we find out they must be extensively operating within the borders of the United States. Otherwise, why would you need legislation that empowers you on American soil? Well, what was so interesting in the lead up to this legislation, there were a couple of things. First of all, uh, Dianne Feinstein had proposed inserting uh, into this section an exemption for American citizens, uh, which both the Democratic Party and the Obama White House rejected. Secondly, uh, you had uh, the Secretary of Defense, you had Mueller, the head of the FBI. All of these people went up to Capitol Hill and testified against this piece of legislation, and yet it passed anyway. Uh, and that raises the issue, why? Why was there such an internal thrust uh, to empower the military to carry out uh, domestic surveillance and detention uh, uh, and, and, you know, on American soil, potentially on American soil? What, it is, what is it that's happening here, even when uh, the heads of other intelligence agencies uh, opposed it? And what do you make of the timing of this legislation? Uh, you know, we're you know more than ten years now from 9/11. Uh, you know, by all security analysts who follow this kind of stuff, the threat level is lower than it's ever been. Certainly lower than it was in the years you know just near after 9/11. Yet now it comes because I don't think that it, it's it's aimed at uh, Islamic radicals. It's aimed at domestic dissidents. That's the point. And that threat uh, is uh, rising uh, as we watch the collapse of globalization, uh, the long-term political paralysis on the part of our corporate state, its inability to deal with uh, fundamental uh, issues that are uh, ravaging American families, whether that's poverty, chronic underemployment, unemployment, uh, all of those issues coupled, of course, with the effects of climate change uh, are leading to a world, uh, both within our borders and outside our borders, of tremendous instability. And you are watching the state accrue to itself through the legal system uh, the powers to essentially keep people in check. And I think that's the real reason for the NDAA. Do you think there's also possibly another rationale to this, which without them saying so, is this part of preparations for war with Iran? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think this has to do with Iran. I think this has to do with internal dissent. Um, I think that uh, you know the, both the lawyers and myself feel that because they issued an emergency appeal, they reacted so aggressively once Judge Forrest declared this section unconstitutional. Uh, they are probably already using the NDAA. Uh, this is supposition, uh, but probably uh, they are holding uh, dual Pakistan U.S. nationals in military facilities like Bagram, uh, because if they weren't using it, they could have just filed an appeal. Uh, the problem is that once the judge declared the law unconstitutional, uh, if they continued to hold American 
citizens and uh, deny them access to due process than they would be in contempt of court. And so uh, the the rapid response, the and it was interesting that it was the Pentagon lawyers that uh, filed this emergency appeal uh, and the issuance of an emergency stay or temporary stay until the appeal is heard, I think essentially is to cover, uh, you know, cover them legally for uh, already putting the NDAA uh, into use. Uh, internally, I really think it has less to do with Iran and a lot more to do with controlling the American public. Okay, the, the panel meets uh, today, essentially, as we're running this story. Uh, how, when do we expect a decision from the panel on whether or not they're going to find this unconstitutional? I don't know, uh, but obviously the government wants to uh, expedite this process. And, uh, you know, it could be a few weeks if the appellate court upholds uh, Judge Forrest's ruling, then uh, there's little doubt that this will end up uh, in the Supreme Court very, very quickly. I mean, in, a, in probably a matter of weeks. All right. So we'll come back to you once we have a decision from the panel and we'll obviously keep following the story. Thanks very much for joining us, Chris. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. Thank you.